right, James chapter 3. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 3. Now, if you've looked in your bulletin, you've seen the, the title of the message, Tale of Two Wisdoms. You might recognize the title as a uh, mimicking the title of the Charles Dickens classic, A Tale of Two Cities. And for those of you who are not familiar with that book, the, it's about two cities in the novel that are London and Paris at the time leading up to and, and during the French Revolution. But that's actually not the two cities that I have in mind as we're thinking of two cities. Um, there's another writer, the fourth century theologian named Augustine. Some of you may have heard of him before. Uh, he's best known for a book that he wrote, um, or at least widely, most li- widely known for the Confessions of Augustine. It's about his conversion to Christianity, which I highly recommend, by the way. But he also wrote another book called The City of God. The City of God is set against the backdrop of the fall of the Roman Empire. And in that book, he distinguished between the eternal city of God and the temporal city of man, and it, which is actually somewhat similar. He's kind of echoing the ideas that John presents in the book of Revelation, where he has the earthly Jerusalem, which is symbolically called Babylon, and the heavenly Jerusalem. So Augustine speaks of these two rival cities that are shaped by opposing loves and are working toward different ends. The earthly city, formed by love of self, even unto the contempt of God, stands in contrast with the heavenly city, the city of God, which is founded and shaped by the love of God, even unto the contempt of self. There's those two cities. Now, more more to the point of today's message, these two cities, the city of God and the city of man, operate on two completely different sets of wisdom. In fact, what is common sense, just this is what everybody accepts in one city, is complete foolishness in the other city. And so it's just like what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians. The wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God are completely opposed to one another. And that's the contrast we're going to be discussing today. It's the contrast between the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. So let's go ahead and read what James has to say about it. James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. So, the, what this is telling us, God's wisdom produces, results in good works. It leads to good outcomes. That's the overall main point of the text. And what we see here is James is returning to the wisdom theme. I told you before, he introduces several of his themes in the early part of the book. He introduced the wisdom theme back in chapter 1, and now he's coming back to develop that theme in more detail. There are actually some commentators who say that this passage is kind of the key to the whole book. This contrast between the wisdom from above, the wisdom from below, is kind of what the whole book is about. And it definitely is an important text. We've already seen that James talks and speaks against an idea of double-mindedness. And that, you know, there's these two ways. There's the way of God and the way of the world. And double-mindedness is kind of wavering back and forth between those two ways. And he contrasts other dualities. He contrasts the authentic faith with false faith. He contrasts uh, pure religion with for, uh, worthless religion. Then now we see wisdom from above contrasted with wisdom from below. And so all that is very important. But I still think that James' most central point is authentic faith that is shown through good works. But it's also shown through one of those good works is following that path, the right path. When you think of those dualities, authentic faith is shown in following true faith, God's wisdom pure religion. It showed in single-mindedly following that right path and not wavering between the paths. 
And once again, we see in this the interrelationship of some of the key concepts in James, faith and wisdom and works. They're all these highly interdependent ideas that kind of feed off of each other. And they, they work together to fuel the Christian life. It's kind of like a nuclear reactor. I, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I did get to learn a little bit about nuclear physics, of how that works when I was in the Naval Academy. And there's, it's, there's various elements, right, that, that react with each other, and they, they create byproducts, which then feed back into that reaction, which keeps it going. It's what we call a chain reaction. Once you get it started, it produces a lot of energy, right? It works, keeps working for a long time. That's kind of how it is with faith and wisdom and works. Logically speaking, faith comes first because Scripture speaks of it being a gift from God. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. So salvation and grace and faith, that's all part of that gift from God. Romans 12, 3 says God has distributed to each one a measure of faith. So faith is given to us by God, and faith, in a sense, produces wisdom. The, the understanding of who God is and, and my, the reality of my sin, my need for a Savior, and then wisdom builds back into faith. As Paul reminded Timothy of the, the Scriptures which give you wisdom unto salvation in Jesus Christ. And, and then faith continues to feed back into wisdom, as we talked about here in James. Authentic faith seeks wisdom from God. And ask God for that wisdom. So now we see this, this reaction beginning between faith and wisdom, and they kind of feed off each other. Uh, just as the, and then just as the nuclear reactor produces heat and energy, faith and wisdom both produce works. We already saw in uh, James 2 that works comes from authentic faith. And our text today produce, talks about the works that come from godly wisdom. So works are a byproduct, if you will, of faith and wisdom. And they also feed back into that reaction as you do works, good works, it increases our faith because we see God working through our actions. And then we, it, our wisdom also grows through the experiences of doing works in the power of God. So faith feeds into wisdom, which feeds back into faith, which produce works, which feed back into both faith and wisdom, and you get this chain reaction. And I'm sorry for the geeky little uh, engineer thing there, but it's just been really fascinating for me to see these different ideas that James has and how they kind of interact with each other and build off of each other. And our, so of all those different interrelated ideas, our text obviously today fo focuses on wisdom. That's the main point that he's talking about. And it's a contrast between these two wisdoms. And James begins by asking this rhetorical question, who among you is wise and understanding? And so he's addressing anyone who would think that they have some measure of wisdom. Uh, he He's addressing, again, those who might think they want to be teachers. Oh, you want to teach? Like he said, did it back at the beginning of uh, chapter 3. You think you have wisdom? You think you want to teach? You think you've come to some level of understanding? Then you need to think about this. He's inviting us by asking this rhetorical question to examine the wisdom that we think we have. Is it true wisdom? Is it wisdom from above? Or is it wisdom from below? And then, so he gives us this comparison now between these two kinds of wisdom. It's a compare and contrast. Remember the compare and contrast essays you had to do back in high school English? Well, this is a compare and contrast between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. And he's inviting us to say, look at the contrasting characteristics. Which, seeing these different characteristics, which kind of wisdom are you operating by? Which kind of wisdom is what is, what is common sense to you? And so, because it's this comparison, I thought it would be useful to structure our discussion today around kind of the three main points of contrast that James presents in this text. There's a contrast in their source of where these two wisdoms come from. There's a contrast in their character. And then there's also a contrast in their results. So it's a contrast in where they come from, in how they operate, and in what they do, or what they produce. And so this text, just you know, normally I kind of go pretty lockstep verse by verse. We're going to not go exactly verse by verse today. We're going to kind of just center, kind of pick up those points of contrast wherever they show up in the text. So the first is the contrast of source. You know, one kind of wisdom, J James says, comes from above. And he doesn't qualify here by what he means by from above. But if we look around in the text, we can find out what he means by that. Because you just look back to... Chapter 1, verse 17, he said, every good and perfect gift is from above. Okay, so what does he mean by from above there? Well, he qualifies it. Coming down from the Father of lights, 
who does not change like shifting shadows. So the wisdom that is from above is wisdom that comes from God. And we know that wisdom comes from God. Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. That is the primary source of wisdom. See, God had wisdom before he even created the world. And it was actually through wisdom that he actually created the universe. Proverbs chapter 8 actually personifies wisdom and talks about how God, he, how wisdom worked with God in order to create the world. It's, um, it says, the Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation, before his works of long ago. This is wisdom speaking. I was formed before ancient times, from the beginning, before the earth began. And then jump down to verse 27. It says, I was there when he, when he established the heavens, when he laid out the horizon on the surface of the ocean, when he placed the skies above, when the fountains of the ocean gushed out, when he set a limit for the sea so the waters would not violate his command, when he laid out the foundations of the earth. In all of that, I was a skilled craftsman beside him. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing before him. So wisdom was, has been with God from eternity past. It's been his possession, if you will. And of that good wisdom that God has had from eternity past, God gives us of that wisdom that he has. And if it's the Lord who gives wisdom, what can we say about it? James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above. So wisdom is from above. Wisdom from God is one of his good and perfect gifts that he gives to us. And since it is from God, it is good and perfect. There is no flaw in it. There is no blemish in his wisdom. This is true wisdom. The book of Job is another wisdom book. And Job says in Job 12, 13, wisdom and strength belong to God. Counsel and understanding are his. And in verse 16 of that same chapter, true wisdom and power belong to him, to God. So one sort of wisdom comes from above comes from God. That's that, the source of the wisdom from above. The other wisdom is from below. But James says even more about its source. He says in verse 15 that this kind of wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. This unholy triad, as one commentator put it, shows us that the wisdom of the world or the wisdom from below does not come from God. It's earthly, number one. That's the very opposite of heavenly, right? It doesn't come from heaven. This is wisdom that is derived from things that can only be seen, it can only be known on earth. It is a wisdom that completely excludes any consideration of God. I mean, think of something like the theory of evolution, right? It's a scientific theory that explicitly removes any possibility of the divine. And that's actually probably true for most modern scientific theories. They assume that the universe is a closed system, that, all, that what you can observe and what you can measure is all that there is. So earthly is just based on what you can see, what you can observe. That's the wisdom that it is, wisdom from below. It's also unspiritual. The word here in the Greek is psychikos, which it means that which pertains to the psyche. You understand the, the word psyche, right? The psyche is the self. It's the, it's the natural life of the person. And that word is almost always contrasted with the spiritual anywhere in Scripture. So unspiritual is a good translation. It's a good way to think about it. It's the natural rather than the supernatural. When it says the, the unspiritual or the, the natural, it's not talking about the blatant lusts of the flesh kind of thing. It's, it's talking about just that which is essentially human, right? It's wisdom that comes about just through the feelings and reasonings of a person without God in, involved. Just of what we can come up with in our own minds. That's what it's talking about. Essentially, human wisdom. And human wisdom is a self-focused wisdom. It's about what advances my earthly personal welfare. It's talking about you know, the conventional wisdom of success. How to win friends and influence people, Right? how to make money quickly, how to pick up girls, how to find love that will make you happy. It's the kind of wisdom that you find in the magazines at the supermarket checkout line, the kind of wisdom that you'll hear from Oprah. It's the wisdom that only takes into account human experience. It's human wisdom. It's not God's wisdom, even though sometimes they do overlap slightly. And then the 
third descriptor of where this wisdom comes from might be a bit surprising to you. Demonic. Demonic. The wisdom of demons, we need to understand, is just as false as the faith of demons that was talked about back in chapter 2, verse 19. And we need to understand that the demons are instigators behind much of the world's wisdom. And sometimes that means that what the world presents as wisdom is outright wicked. It's obviously wicked. Now, other times, though, it seems plausible. You know, it seems like maybe it's not that different from God's wisdom. Because the demons are clever. They mix in just enough false into the mix so that it's plausible. Just enough that it corrupts the whole thing, but not so it's obvious. And a good, good example of this might be like all that just believe in yourself stuff, right? Be true to yourself. Sounds so good. You know, a lot of people get quotes to that nature and put them on their bumper stickers or their coffee mugs or in their journals or whatever. And most people will be nodding in agreement. You know how popular it is because Disney's made a lot of money selling that philosophy. But the Bible doesn't say believe in yourself. The Bible says believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't say be true to yourself. The Bible says deny yourself. So the wisdom from below is false because of its source. And if actually, if you think about those three places that James says it comes from, it's the three perennial enemies of Christians. The world, the flesh, and the devil. That's where the world, wisdom of the world comes from. So the two wisdoms could not be more different in their source. Now, and given the difference in the source of the two wisdoms, it's no surprise that they have very different character. They show very different attitudes that underlie the thinking and motivate the actions. The first one, the wisdom from above, it says in verse 13, it shows gentleness. Now, this word translated gentleness is defined, if I look in my Greek lexicon of the word behind that, it defines it as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. That's what that word means. So, it can also be translated humility or courtesy, or meekness. This is a quality that was actually looked down upon by the philosophers of the day, and the, the Greek philosophers. They, they thought of this as a weakness, a sign of servility. But this is a quality that Jesus taught, and Jesus modeled during his time on earth. What it is, it starts with a sense of one's unworthiness before God. As you, you, you recognize, we are a sinful creature, I am a sinful creature, and God is holy, and God is majestic. It starts with an unworthiness before God, and it continues to manifest itself in a lack of pride, a lack of arrogance in the way we deal with others. So the wisdom from above is humble. It rightly understands the relationship between God and man. And because of that recognition, godly wisdom seeks wisdom from God because he recognizes that he is the source of all wisdom. And that's not circular to say it's wise to seek wisdom from God because it's wise to recognize one's lack of wisdom and to know where the right source for, for making up that lack is, which is from God. And God, James told us this in chapter 1, and he said the wisdom from above it, you know, humbly receives the wisdom from God. He said back in chapter 1, verse 21, humbly receive the implanted word. And it's actually the same word there, where it says humbly receive. The same word is here in our verse 13, translated gentleness. So the wisdom from above is humble. And it lacks, and it recognizes its own lack of wisdom, and is so it's teachable, willing to receive wisdom from God. Now then, more character qualities of this wisdom from above are then given in verse 17. Pure, peace-loving gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. Sounds a bit like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Which actually kind of makes sense, because this is wisdom that comes from the Spirit. Now, the first attribute is purity, sometimes translated as holy. It's listed first because all the other attributes flow from this first one. By purity, James is talking about moral blamelessness. The wisdom from above is without any stain, without any blemish. It's incapable of producing anything evil. It doesn't have any of that mixture of good and bad 
that, uh, that would be called double-mindedness. It, it's unstained by the world. And this purity is the, the most important because you can have all the rest of the characteristics in the list, but if they don't come from a pure, undivided focus on God, then if they don't come from an authentic faith, then they're meaningless. All those other qualities are meaningless without the purity to begin things. But when they're added to purity, they're very meaningful. Now, one thing you won't notice in English on the rest of the list is that it's intentionally divided into three groups based on uh, certain uh, parts of the word. That is, it seems like it's intentionally done as a mnemonic device to help remember this list. So the first three qualities all start with the same Greek letter, and they all seem to, to uh, relate to a person's dif- disposition. As wisdom from above is peace-loving, or more literally, just peaceful. This, this kind of wisdom doesn't look for trouble. It doesn't try to start arguments just for argument's sake. It's also gentle. This is now a different word than the one for gentleness in verse 13. Different word. It's, it means kind. It means courteous. It means being considerate of others. Someone with this quality is willing to yield to others, and when wronged, will not assert their, abil- their, their right to get back at the, the person who wronged them. And then the third quality is compliant. Now, compliant has kind of a negative, uh, probably, nuance in our, our mind, so maybe accommodating would be a better word, or, or willing to submit. This, the person with this quality is willing to submit to authority but also in willing to submit to others in the sense of considering other people more important than himself. So that's the first group, is these peaceful and, and gentle and compliant or accommodating. Then The next two qualities that are, are grouped by this, this phrase at the beginning, full of, and it's, it, that phrase applies to both of them, and this seems to be actions, mercy, full of mercy, it, refers to love for a neighbor that, that shows itself in tangible actions, particularly when we're talking mercy, love for a neighbor who is, is poor and needy, someone who's kind of in a, a state of neediness, vulnerable. And the second one, full of good fruit, is closely related to that, but it's broader. It's actions that honor God, actions that show love to other people. So wisdom from God, we see again, shows itself in actions, but we're going to talk more about that in a minute. So I'm going to move on to the last two qualities of this wisdom from above. And these last two start with the same Greek prefix. It's actually the, the letter alpha, which is li- related to the Greek, or to the English prefix un, like you see in unwavering, or unfortunate, or un, you know, whatever. And so both of them have that prefix. And the first one is unwavering. The word translated as unwavering here has a couple of senses, which we're not really sure which one James had in mind, but both are actually fairly true. It's, this word here is the, the negative of the word that James used in chapter 2, verse 4, when he said people had made distinctions uh, with, by showing favoritism. And so here it could mean that wisdom from above is impartial. It doesn't make wrongful distinctions. But James also used that same word in chapter 1, verse 6, where he said that we are to ask for wisdom without, without doubting. Ask in faith without doubting. And so the word... Unwavering could mean without doubting, which that would make sense, without wavering. So I think most likely the unwavering nuance is correct, but wisdom from above is also impartial, so they both fit. But wisdom from above is single-mindedness, single-minded in its focus on God. It's not double-minded. It doesn't waver back and forth between, oh, I want to go this way, or I want to go after the world, wisdom of the world. And then the last word term is without pretense. It means genuine. It means sincere. It doesn't put on an act. The person is fir- firmly committed to this wisdom. He's fable. He's trustworthy. So that's, there you see the character of the wisdom of God. It's, it's, it's wisdom that we're talking about here. It's not the Holy Spirit, but it comes through the Spirit. It's divinely given. It has, so, and it would make sense that if it's divinely given wisdom, it has a divine character. Completely different from the wisdom from below. The character of the wisdom from below is is bitter envy and selfish ambition. It's the exact opposite of the humility and the kindness of the wisdom from above. 
The word envy, of course, refers to intense negative feelings over someone else's achievements or success. The person with bitter envy is always comparing, always competing. They seek for what's best for them, regardless of how that affects anybody else. And if something, someone else gets something good or has something good happen to them, this person with bitter envy can't be happy about it because they think, that should have been me that got that. And then selfish ambition is closely related. It's the idea of doing anything to get ahead, regardless of who you have to step on. It's a word that was used primarily in the context of partisan politics and sectarian rivalry. It pictures people in angry competition with each other, undermining each other, fighting for their own little piece of the pie or their own, little, their own rights. And you can see from both of these qualities of the wisdom from below that they're very self-focused. Which makes sense, right? Because we talked about where the wisdom from below comes from. It comes from the self. It comes from human reasoning and emotions that are focused on the self. The wisdom of the world is inherently self-oriented. It's all about what makes me feel good, what gets me promoted, what gets me rich, what gets me secure. Me, me, me. That's what the wisdom of the world is about. And it might actually work to do those things. It might actually, following the wisdom of the world might actually make you feel good. It might actually help you Get money. You know, reading self-help books and business leadership books might help you get ahead. That get-rich-quick plan might actually gain you money. It might actually be effective in those things, but whatever gains you get from it are temporary, and they're usually made at the expense of other people. Because the world's wisdom is not concerned with other people, except as how they might benefit me in some way. Right? Wisdom of the world might actually involve giving to charity, but only because that makes me feel good about myself and because that makes other people respect me because I'm so giving. The world's wisdom is all about me. It is a naturally selfish wisdom. So James James tells us here in this passage, if that's the sort of wisdom that you have, don't take pride in that. Although the wisdom of the world is also naturally arrogant, it's naturally proud, it wants recognition, it says, look at me, look what I have achieved with my wisdom. Look at the wealth I have accumulated, look at the business I have built, look at the degrees I have earned. That's the world's wisdom, or even in the church, right? Look at my family, how my obedient children. Look at the church I have built. Look at the theology blog that I write that has so many readers. Whatever, it's self-focused. It's kind of like King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, right? He walked on the roof of his palace. Verse 30, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built as my royal residence by my vast power and from my majestic glory? That's the world's wisdom. What did God do? God humbled him that very moment. And he actually took away his wisdom so that he actually acted like an animal. So James is saying is if in this passage here, is that if the wisdom you are going by, if the things that you, is kind of common sense to you involves selfishness, if, if focused on yourself, if it involves pushing ahead of other people, then you shouldn't be boasting about that. You shouldn't be crowing about that. You shouldn't be proud of that sort of wisdom, regardless of how many people in the world praise you for it. You could be on the Forbes magazine, you know, hottest entrepreneurs of the year list, You might be asked to speak at conferences, but if your wisdom shows up in jealousy and selfishness, then it is opposed to Jesus' teaching, and you should not be proud of that. It denies the truth of the gospel that you claim to believe, if that's the wisdom that you are following. See, the wisdom of the world is vastly different in character from the wisdom of God. And so finally, the two wisdoms come from different sources, they have a different character, And the two wisdoms produce entirely different results. Wisdom from above produces good conduct. See this in verse 13. And it produces good works. And of course, the works that James is talking about is the same ones that he's been talking about, like in chapter 2. They're actions that are motivated by the first and second greatest commandments, to love God with your whole being, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the works. Some of you might remember a few weeks ago, I've preached from James chapter 1, 19 to 27, and I titled the message, Wisdom Is as Wisdom Does, right? Because wisdom, true wisdom, is shown in actions. 
And you'll notice if you look back at that passage that the word wisdom is nowhere in that passage. Just the actions that come from wisdom. It's the whole, the whole passage is like the book of Proverbs. Things you do to show wisdom. True wisdom is quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. True godly wisdom shows devotion to God through obedience to his word. And not just hearing his word, but also doing his word so that you remove moral filth from your life and you keep yourself unstained by the world. True wisdom controls the tongue. True wisdom cares for orphans and widows in their distress. Wisdom is as wisdom does. See, the truism that you know a tree by its fruit applies to wisdom as well. The true wisdom comes from God, and then true wisdom displays the character of God, and ultimately true wisdom does the works of God, as he has told us about in his word. That's what identifies true wisdom. Actually, back in the book of Proverbs, they also, the, the writer there also does a contrast between two wisdoms. And he doesn't call them both wisdom calls one of them foolishness, because it's a contrast not between two wisdoms, but rather between true wisdom and false wisdom. Because the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's eyes. And he, in this contrast, this Proverbs chapter 8, he personifies the two as two women. There's lady wisdom and lady folly. Lady wisdom, if you look at the chapter, displays the same characteristics of the wisdom from above that James talks about here. Proverbs 8.13, Lady Wisdom hates arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. But she's also marked by the results that she produces. Verse 15, by her, kings reign and rulers enact just laws. Verse 18, with me are riches and honor, lasting wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than solid gold, my harvest than pure silver. I walk in the ways of righteousness along the paths of justice, giving wealth as an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. In verse 34, anyone who listens to me is happy. Verse 35, the one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. So true wisdom produces justice. It produces righteousness. It cultivates peace. And those who follow true wisdom are blessed by God. This accords just exactly with what James says here in verse 18. Wisdom from above produces the fruit of righteousness, and it cultivates peace. These are obviously agricultural metaphors, right? Those who are wise are like farmers of peace. They painstakingly sow and water and fertilize seeds of peace. So rather than envying others who have good things, they give good things to others. Rather than selfish ambition to get ahead by stepping on others, they actually give others a leg up to help them get ahead, rather than, and even at cost to themselves. They don't insist on their own rights and privileges. They look out for others. That's true wisdom. And a farmer, remember, doesn't just plant the right seeds and nurture the right plants. A farmer also has to remove the bad plants. So true wisdom will also pull out the weeds of conflict, will squash Rumors, for example, that would disrupt the unity of the church community. A truly wise person will sure, make sure that no one is left out because they're looked down upon by others. That everyone is cared for regardless of external circumstances. They will actively work against division and will work hard to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what true wisdom will do. And when this is done, the wise will get to harvest the fruit of righteousness. Just as grapes or the natural product of a grapevine, righteousness is the natural product of true wisdom. And this goes not just, this isn't just for the person themselves who is exercising this wisdom, this is for the entire community that they're involved with. So a person following true godly wisdom will spread peace like a farmer casting seeds. And like a wake behind a ship, the wise person will just leave peace wherever they go. And they will they just influence their surroundings for peace. That's what they do. That's what a truly wise person does. And the righteousness that is produced from that isn't just in that person. It's, it's just in person people around them. Righteousness will flourish and grow all around a person like this. And when the operating principle of a community, like a church community, is true godly wisdom, then this community will be like a lush garden. Fresh green lawns of peace with sweet fruit and vibrant blossoms of righteousness all around. So 
That is the wisdom from above. And the wisdom from below produces a completely different result. The selfish, worldly wisdom produces disorder and every evil practice. Those who seek their own glory, seek their own selfish preferences in church will just tear things apart and will leave wickedness where, they go, where they've been. It will open the door for wickedness to come in. The word translated disorder here is another form of the word that James used to describe the double-minded person. It describes an instability or an unsettled state. Luke actually uses the same word to describe the tumultuous times right before Jesus returns. It's that kind of chaos. It's the very opposite of peace. Worldly wisdom spreads strife. It spreads divisiveness. Paul used the same word. He was writing to the Corinthians when they were following the wisdom from below in how they used their spiritual gifts in the church. They tried to show off. They tried to draw attention to themselves. Look how great my spiritual gift is. They had a competitive spirit about the various ministries they were involved in. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of disorder. That's the same word as James used here. God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. So if that's what you're doing, if you're creating that kind of strife and disorder, that's not godly wisdom. When people pursue their own selfish concerns, they pursue partisan causes rather than the good of the whole body, that's when this kind of disorder arises. And this applies to all the believers in the church, of course. Any of us can, can sow strife and, and create strife in the church, but leaders and teachers have to be particularly careful about this because of the level of influence that they hold within the church. As one writer put it, Envy and selfish ambition among leaders have tremendous potential to damage the unity and order of the church as a whole. When those who are being looked to for direction and wise counsel act on the basis of personal agenda or on, in a spirit of one-upmanship toward one another, great damage to the church results. That is so true. When the church is in a chaotic state, the problem with that is that undermines the witness of the church to the community around it takes away the church's ability to minister effectively to the members of the church. And not only that, it opens the door for evil. When we operate by earthly wisdom, seeking our own uh, honor, our own status in the church, and it's, it's a sense opening the door and saying, Satan, come on in. Have your way with our congregation. Do what you want. This is what the world calls wisdom. This is what God calls utter foolishness. So you can see that the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world are on completely different trajectories. The wisdom of God brings about peace and righteousness. The wisdom of the world results in chaos and evil. Two different trees, two completely different kinds of fruit. And so again, in presenting this, context, in this contrast between the two wisdoms, James is inviting us to consider which kind of wisdom are we living by? Which kind of wisdom are you living by? First of all, consider the source. Are you getting your kind of rules to live by for your life? Are you getting them from Scripture? Or are you getting them from the world? From culture, from society? Do you, like, for example, do you get relationship advice from the Bible? Or do you get it from your friends at work and from Dr. Phil? If you have a crisis that you're struggling to handle, do you look for answers from Scripture and maybe some godly uh, people in your church family? Or do you just scour the internet looking for quick ways to, to solve your problem? So consider the source. Also consider the character. What does the basic common sense that you operate by look like? Is it humble? Is it infused with Christ-like qualities? Is it focused on other people? Or is it focused on self? And generally have to do with what makes you successful, what makes you comfortable, what makes you happy. And then third, consider the result. What's the natural outcome that generally uh, attends to the way you live your life and the kind of decisions that you make? Do you tend to bring peace to situations? Do you tend to influence others for righteousness? 
Or do you tend to spread disorder and, and conflict? Do you tend to create an environment where anger and backbiting are common? See, this is the sort of self-assessment that we should all make regularly. Which wisdom am I operating by? And I know this is hard, right? Because again, back to those two cities, we're split between the two cities. Once we've become a follower of Christ, we are made a citizen of the city of God. And that's the the place we're supposed to live by those rules, live by the values and the common sense, if you will, of the city of God. That's what we're supposed to do. The problem is that we have been born in and grown up in and live in the city of man. This is where we live. The society we live in operates by a completely different uh, wisdom than than we're supposed to. It considers that just common sense. That's just what you do. And so we have to actively work against that, go against that flow. We have to to work actively, seek out a, a different wisdom, seek out and pursue the wisdom of God. We have to work to counteract the wisdom that we basically drank in like water our entire lives. We have to work hard at this. And the first step is to humble yourself before God and learn from him. Recognize that his wisdom is true wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of God is understanding. That's where we start. And then we need to follow other instruction in the book of Proverbs, like Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. Whatever else you get, get understanding. We have to have that kind of a drive. As it says elsewhere, seek it like silver. Search for it like hidden treasure. We have to be driven to find wisdom from God and recognize that wisdom is found in Christ and in his word. As 1 Corinthians 1 said earlier, Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God, and Colossians 2, 3, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So that's what we do. We need to follow hard after Christ. And if we do, we will find true wisdom. Dig into the scriptures like a miner digging for gold, searching for that mother load. And that's where you're going to find wisdom, is here in the scriptures. And as we do that, we also need to pray. As James said earlier in, this, in, in his letter, pray, pray that God will give you wisdom as you are seeking wisdom. And the great thing is he's promised that he will. So trust him that he has given wisdom. And then we need to live according to the wisdom that God gives. Let that become our default operating system. That become our common sense It's summed up very well in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which many of you probably know by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the source of all wisdom. We know that we live in a society, in a place whose wisdom is opposed to you. It completely excludes you from the equation. Lord, we ask that you would help us to step aside from that wisdom, to seek out the wisdom that you've given to us in your word, to seek wisdom in Christ, not in the ways of the world. Help us to be transformed by the power of your word and that our wisdom will become your will we will follow after your wisdom and it will become our common sense and our just way of operating so that the fruit of peace and righteousness will be evident in our lives and in our church we pray all these things in Jesus name and for his glory amen